In this video, we demonstrate how to estimate an autoregressive model in Oxmetrics. We will work with the first difference in the log of the house price index for the Danish economy. This appears to be a stationary variable, maybe with a few large outliers. But anyway, we will work with the first difference in the log of the price index. We will estimate an autoregressive model, so it's a univariate model for the change in the house price index given its past. So effectively, we are working with an ARIMA model for the log of the house price. We will use a general to specific principle, so we start with a general model, make sure that it's fairly well specified, and then we try to impose various restrictions on the model to get a simpler model which can still represent the data. The first thing we will look at is the autocorrelation function and the partial autocorrelation function for the change in the house price index. So we go to the graph window, we select time series properties, autocorrelation function, and partial autocorrelation function here. We say plot, and we get the following plot. So remember that an autoregressive model with p lags will have exactly p non-zero terms in the partial autocorrelation function. So the idea of the Box Jenkins identification is that we look at the autocorrelation function and the partial autocorrelation function to determine the number of lags we want to include in an armor model. Here we will only work with an autoregressive model, so we look at the partial autocorrelation function, that's the blue bars, and we see how many of these terms appear to be significant. Note that the first term here is clearly significant, then we have the second, third, and fourth, they appear close to zero, but then the fifth lag could be significant. So we could start with a model with at least five lags, and what I will do is start with a model with six lags. So I click on model over here, I use the PCGIF module, select model for time series, single equation dynamic modeling, and then we want to formulate the model. So here we will select up to six lags, and then we simply add DLKP, which is the first difference in the log of the house price index. A constant is added automatically, and now we have included six lags. We click OK. We select OLS as our estimator. We see here that the estimation sample starts fourth quarter of 72, and until the end of the sample that we have available here, 2003, second quarter. We click OK, and we get the following model estimated. Note that the model here will have a number, EQ1, so we will use that later to compare the various models. We get the estimated coefficients, we get the standard errors, and we get the t-values, and then we get the usual uh, summary of the model, number of observations, the estimated residual standard deviation, r squared, and so on. And finally, the log likelihood. And then we get the misspecification test down here. And note that we want our general model to be well specified. In particular, we want a model with no autocorrelation in the estimated residuals. We get a p-value for the test of no autocorrelation of order 1 to 5 of roughly 50%. So we are not able to reject that there is no autocorrelation in the estimated residuals. We cannot reject no heteroskedasticity. We cannot reject no arch effects. But we do have a small problem here with normality. If we look at a graph of the estimated residuals, go to the test menu, click graphic analysis, and then we do the usual four plots, we get the following. And note that it seems like we have a problem with these two outliers that we also saw in data before. You could include two DOMI variables to capture that. We will not do it here, but in general, that would be a good idea. So what we will do now is continue with this model. We will use a general to specific principle. So this is our general model. It is fairly well specified, so we can start doing statistical inference. If we just look at the estimated coefficients here, note that the coefficient to the sixth lag seems to be insignificant, or it is insignificant, based on the t-test. We also note that the fourth lag here is also insignificant, so is the third lag and the second lag. So the only two coefficients here that are actually significant, that's the first lag and that's the fifth lag. And note that that's exactly what we also saw in the partial autocorrelation before. We could continue in various ways. So one way which we will use is to start by imposing a restriction on the last lag. So we will start from this AR6 model and try to see if we can get to an AR5, AR4, AR3, 2, or so, and so on. Alternatively, we could impose a restriction first on the coefficient that is most insignificant. That would give us a different path, and in the end, we would get 
different results. So note that the way we impose these restrictions, if we do it stepwise, will lead to different results. What I will do now is try to estimate the AR5, the AR4, the AR3, and so on. We will estimate all models because that gives us the opportunity to compare and see what happens along the way. So the first model we estimate, that is just removing the sixth lag. So this is an AR5 model. Note we keep the estimation sample the same because that allows us to test the restriction of going from an AR6 to an AR5. We click OK and we get the following model out. Note that again the model seems to be fairly well specified. There's not a big change in the misspecification tests. If we look at the estimated coefficients, they are also more or less the same. And in particular, we get the same conclusion that the first and the fifth lag seem to be significant. Now let's try to remove the fifth lag. And we get a new model here. Note what happened to the test for no autocorrelation. The p-value dropped from roughly 50% to 8%. So this is a huge change and it means that there might be some autocorrelation in the model, which makes sense given that we threw out a variable, the fifth lag, which appeared to be significant. We will continue imposing more restrictions and get the estimation output for the other models. So here's the AR3. Let's just do it quickly. The AR2, like this. AR1. And finally, the seventh model, an AR0, or just a model where the change is IID, like this. So now we have estimated all these uh, seven different models, and we want to compare them. So we could, of course, at each step, just consider the t-test, but we could also estimate all the models like we've done now, go to the model window, and click progress. Here we have to make sure that the models we are considering are nested, and in this case, all the models are nested. The AR5 is nested in the AR6, the AR4 is nested in the AR5, and so on. We select them all, click OK, and this is what we get. The first part gives us an overview. Here we have EQ1, this is our AR6 model from above. The number of observations, note that it's the same for all models. This is the number of parameters, the estimation technique. Then we get the log likelihood, which we can use to compute the likelihood ratio test. And then we get the three standard information criteria. Finally, below, we get a test model reduction. So for example, this line, this is the likelihood ratio test of going from an AR6 to an AR5 model. We get a p-value of roughly 50%. So here we cannot reject imposing the restriction of an AR6 to an AR5 model. Then we could ask if we could restrict the AR5 to an AR5. For model, this is the test we have down here, but just note that the p-value here is below 5%, so we reject imposing that restriction. So we will continue with the AR5 model based on this sequential testing. Alternatively, we could look at the information criteria which are reported up here, and recall that the information criteria balances the fit of the model against the number of parameters relative to the sample size. The different information criteria vary in how they specify this penalty. We want to select the uh, model with the lowest information criteria. Oxmetrics indicates which one that is. So based on the SC information criteria, we select equation 6, which is an AR1 model. The same holds for the HQ information criteria, while the AIC information criteria selects the AR5 model. So note that here we get different results. In the end, we have to choose one of them that we will continue working with. I will continue here with the AR5 model. So we go back to our formulate window. And now here we can recall one of the previous models. So here I will recall equation two. That's the AR5 model. I click OK, estimate. And here I keep the uh, estimation sample from before. We estimate the model like this. We briefly want to look at the estimated residuals. We get the following plot and we note that except from these potential outliers, these two outliers in the 80s, the model looks like it's fairly well specified. Now it can be discussed if we want to get rid of these three lags, the second, the third and the fourth. They are based on the t-test insignificant, so you could do that. That's what some people would do while others would prefer to have a model with no holes like that in the lag structure. So here we will just continue with this AR5 model. We include these three lags even though they are insignificant. 